The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. I'm Maura Aarons Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever, the show that looks at the intersection of mental health and work, and how we can all do both better. Do you ever treat yourself like an enemy? <laughs> you know, I find this to be true with a lot of anxious achievers, myself included. And then The worst thing is we push ourselves and we're not nice to ourselves and we don't sleep and we don't take care of ourselves and we hold ourselves to ridiculously high standards and we get rewarded for it at work. But the long-term consequences aren't great. Today, we dive in to how to be your own best friend. Part of my Thinkers 50 LinkedIn Live series throughout May. My guests include Sanyin Shang, professor at Duke and head of the Coach K Center on Leadership, the incredible Julie lithcott Hames, best-selling author who has been on the show before, and Lenny Mendonca, who has also been on the show before. He is a former McKinsey partner and a really big figure in California politics who speaks openly about his experience with depression and what it's taught him about leadership. We'll talk about some tools that help us and share some revelations on the effect of trying to be a quote, winner all the time on our work and our relationships. The sound isn't 100%, but the content is. We'll be back soon with regular episodes of The Anxious Achiever, but I did want to bring you my special May LinkedIn Live series with Thinkers 50 and the Silicon Guild, exploring all facets of mental health and leadership. I am so thrilled to be back with you all. I am joining you all from a WeWork in London. The noise situation is not ideal, but because this session is about being kind to yourself, I'm just going to go with it. And I actually would love you to go with me on one more thing. I want to do an experiment before we dive in here. So if you're willing to go on this experiment with me, I would like you to close your eyes. This is inspired by a wonderful meditation on gratitude I did this morning from a man named Pascal Eau Claire. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about two qualities about yourself that you like or admire. Now, this could be a quality like I make a mean coffee cake or wonderful coffee, or it could be something big like I'm solving world peace. I don't care. Think about two qualities that you like about yourself and really, really see them, see them in your mind. And now I want you to think about two things you're grateful for, two things that you're grateful for, and just hold that for a minute. You know, those two simple questions are tools that I use when I'm feeling like the world is hard, things are uncertain, and I'm not sure I'm up to the task. And that's what today's session is about. And we have amazing people to share their stories, their tools, and their own personal battles with anxiety, mental health, perfectionism, inner critic, you name it. I wrote a book called The Anxious Achiever, and I work with people who hold themselves to very high standards. It's funny, I did a poll on LinkedIn, and 87% of you said that you hold yourself to higher expectations than you hold other people. I get it. But again, do we have to do that? Do we have to do that? So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about being practical, keeping that drive for success, which we know and love in ourselves but being a better friend to ourselves as well. We're going to have some remarks from our speakers and then a dialogue. And I'm going to kick it over to Sanyin to start us off. Oh, Mara, first of all, thank you for that exercise. I feel myself tearing up because there's all these memories that are just images that are flooding in. It's a joy to be here. And I meant that joy to be here with 
friends who I admire and respect. And in a session that is formed by two communities, Silicon Guild and Thinkers 50, that I'm so honored and proud to be a part of. So I'll start off in my remarks, I'll get personal, and I'll talk about three perspectives that was helpful for me that I hope will be helpful for those who are listening, and then conclude with something that's also personal and meaningful. So for those who see me, I'm usually a butterflies, unicorn, and rainbows type of person. (laughs) However, none of us is immune to anxiousness, to sadness. And last spring, I was feeling really sad and having some not so great thoughts. And I talked to my husband about it. And Chad, who's a physician, said, you know, Sun Yun, so much of this is also neurochemistry. So let's get you some help. So I started seeing a therapist. And what that insight was so helpful for was, one, every one of us face this. And we all need help. But where there's help available to be able to accept it, because that's our gift to ourselves. And the therapist is wonderful. She asked questions. She helped me unpack a lot of things because there was really no reason for me to be sad, but that doesn't mean that I can't be sad. And in the unpacking, we landed on one key thing, which is this feeling that I didn't feel like I was worthy. I was struggling with this idea of mattering. And I was so focused on my deficiencies that I was overlooking whatever proficiencies that were out there. And that, as we were unpacking that, I realized, oh, that ties with my superpowers work. Because the entire idea of superpowers is what makes us extraordinary to everyone else is also one of our biggest blind spots because we don't value, it's our normal. So we don't value what comes easily to us. And that extraordinariness may not only be in things that are achievement related, but it's also the ability to be curious, the ability to bring joy capital. And we need a bigger way of seeing the full range of value and worth. And the thing is, we all have that value. We all have that worth because we're human beings. We need others to help see us ourselves clearly. And we can also help others see the extraordinariness in them. So that's one. Recognize, accept. What if instead of saying, oh, what do I bring to the table? We flip it and we say, I have something to contribute. Let's discover what that is. And others have something to contribute because they're human and they have experiences. Let's discover what that is. And I'll land on the second thing, which is this idea of withness. And that's the underlying theme is in order to cultivate, discover our differentiating contributions to make the biggest possible difference in the world and to become our best selves, it's actually with others. Joy is infectious. So let's be infected by other people's joy. (laughs) We have blind spots. We have blind spots on what makes us good. We have blind spots on where we can be better. Let's invite others in. And then conversely, we can be that person that helps others see their extraordinary. So let's take this idea of imposter syndrome, which I love talking about because at its heart, it's this feeling of belonging. And oh boy, I got imposter syndrome in spades. I mean, look, Thinkers 50 and Silicon Guild, I'm a I'm surrounded by like the most brilliant people in the world. So yeah, when I enter into these meetings, I'm going to be questioning my intelligence. I mean, I'm in awe of all of you. I can see you're extraordinary. I'm like, oh, what do I contribute? But let's flip that around. Well, one, I realize, you know, when you're thinking about that gratefulness exercise, I was thinking, I I know I can bring heart, you know, and we don't have to compete on heart. Everyone can maximize on heart and there will still be an abundance. I I bring heart. I know that. That's why I hold on to. And then the second thing is recognize other people may be feeling imposters. And so the best way to minimize, I found imposter syndrome for myself is to minimize it for others. Shout out their contributions. (laughs) Shout out how amazing they are. And then the third aspect that helped me on this journey, and it is a journey, because it's not like suddenly, oh, I've I've arrived. I'm I'm happy all the time. It's a journey. 
The third aspect is the sense of awe. So I've been reading up on Paul Keltner and Jonathan Haidt's work on awe. And then there's a British author named Catherine Mays that I'm just recently introduced to, and her work is on enchantment. And I think, I mean, if you look in my office, there's plants. I love gardening because I think when we tend to things, first of all, gardeners have faith in the future because when we plant something, (laughs) we don't see its blossom until much, much later. And when we tend to something, we learn to love it. We not only love what we tend to, but we learn to love what we tend to. And when I think about that, there's so many moments of wonder and all around us. And we're in a world where we are, you know, like talking to Martin Lindstrom. He was like, why are we doing this all the time when there's this? And so being infused with that sense of awe and wonder, and there are all moments all around us. And then finally, when I think about all those things, instead of striving for perfection, what if we strive for mending? And here's what I mean by that. In 2020, the last trip we took before 2020, one of the last trips was a trip to Asheville. And there my family made a beautiful, I mean, it's crooked and everything, but I think it's beautiful, little bowl. And it meant so much to us during the pandemic because I look at that and I think, oh, we're going to go back to Asheville again. Someday this is going to be over and we can go travel again. And one day my seven-year-old son broke the bowl and I was just devastated and he felt terrible. And all right, so let's search for how we bend the bowl. And I found this Japanese art of kintsuki, which is broken bowls mended with gold and it's actually an art form. So we did just that. And the thing with kintsuki is, you know, once it's mended, let's mend it towards the more beautiful. So instead of trying to protect ourselves from breakage, because it will inevitably happen, because we're human and life is messy and life is hard, why don't we focus our energies on becoming master menders? Except in our life, instead of mending it with gold, by the way, this is craft gold, but in real kintsuki, it's real gold. Instead of mending our lives with gold, we're mending it with moments of awe, friendships, and a deep belief and acceptance of our extraordinariness because we're human. That's so beautiful in so many ways. It's my turn to tear up. I'm going to ask you a question that I ask a lot of extraordinary leaders, which is after they've gone through a period of pain, of learning, maybe in therapy, of introspection, how did that experience or did it change how you lead? Mm. Well, to lead others, we have to have the right relationship with ourselves. We have to lead ourselves first. And that acceptance of one's flaws, one's I mean, I play my mistakes over and over in my head. I'm learning how to be better at not doing that, but I still do. I would remember something from when I was age seven and think, oh, why was I such an idiot? I mean, that was years and years ago, but we end up in that moment. And I think being able to accept that and say, I know I work with Coach K and Coach K is always saying, next play, do you want to look in the rear view mirror all the time? Next play. Having those mantras, having the advice of, I mean, these are some amazing mentors right behind me. Like, by the way, the way I have my office set up, there are days when I want to quit and I'm like so mad and I turn around and I'll be like, what would Marshall say? <laughs> what would Francis say? Right. I'm in conversations with these amazing, um, it's witness all the time. But having that better relationship with myself can help make us even more compassionate when dealing with our teammates. When we help ourselves flourish, we help our teammates flourish. And by the way, if we want to be a quality human person, if we want to become our best selves, the best thing we can do is surround ourselves with people who want to see us flourish. So unpacking that compassion towards ourselves, I think it can help us be even more compassionate towards others. And that's what the world needs. Thank you so much. Lenny, over to you. Thank you, Maura, and thank you, Sun Yen, for kicking us off with those wonderful thoughts. Get us in the right mindset here. 
so I will start with a disclaimer that I am far from an expert on this topic. And my perspective is from an N of one, from my own personal experience, having had challenges in the past. And let me take you back to a little over four years ago at the beginning, the early days of COVID. And Governor Newsom in California sent out a press release that I had resigned as his chief economic and business advisor to spend more time with my family and my local businesses. And when you send out a press release on Friday afternoon, it usually means you're trying to bury it. And that while that statement may have technically been true, something else must have been going on. Most people who knew me assumed that I had gotten in an argument or something and I'd gotten fired or resigned. And I didn't respond to any request for what was going on for several weeks. Well, what was going on was something very different. The, I had had a panic attack a few weeks before and spent the night in the hospital. And the next day after that press release, I voluntarily got checked into the involuntary psychiatric ward at Stanford Hospital for 10 days for severe depression. I had not been sleeping, not eating very much, and was having horrible thoughts about what was going on in the world and how it was going to end. And that was clearly not me, but I didn't know what was going on because nothing like that had ever happened to me or anyone that I knew. Fortunately, I had a very attentive wife and children and friends who picked me up and said, we're going to the hospital and you're going to check yourself in. I also was fortunate to be able to have the healthcare coverage and access to Stanford University within driving distance. And those are all real privileges. And I got the kind of care I needed. And 10 days later, I checked out and was on the path to recovery. But looking back, I needed that intervention. It wasn't something that I was going to ever be able to handle myself. I was spiraling into a view of what was going on with me in the world that was not going to end well. But it took others paying attention to help me get the kind of help that I needed. And I'm really grateful for that. It was a few months of recovery, but there were really three things that helped me through that that I try and do today. One was get enough sleep. It sounds so basic, but many of us, including me, was in a you know all-encompassing work environment where it was hard to sleep because there was always something else you could be doing. And it was hard to clear your mind when you're getting ready to go to sleep. And so I was not sleeping very well. That's not a problem today. Secondly, I made a particular point of getting out daily and exercising outside, even in crappy weather, both the getting a little movement happening and being out in nature really was for me, it continues to be something that helps clear my head and start thinking about other things other than what was right in front of you. And the final thing, and again, this was at the encouragement of my wife and my daughters, I decided to tell my story. And I, I wrote a opinion piece on it in Cal Matters, and I've probably written a hundred opinion pieces in my life. And I got an order of magnitude more response to this one than anything I've else I've ever written. And a lot of it was from people I didn't know who reached out and said, thank you for talking about this and wanted to tell me their story. And, you know, I now will make, if anyone asks to come talk about the topic, and it's often at business settings or government settings where people want to have an excuse to have a prop to have someone else talk about the topic so that they can talk about it, I do that. And the combination of being able to sleep getting out and getting exercise, and then being open and honest about my own challenge on this front is really helpful to me. You know, I talked about in the piece that I wrote that a few years earlier had broken my leg riding a bike. And you can't hide when you've got a broken leg and people see you, they ask you what happened. Well, if you have a mental health challenge, people don't necessarily see it. And you have to talk about it in a way that helps people understand the issue because it's just as pronounced as when I broke my leg. And I honestly try and talk about it as though it's the same thing. I broke my leg. It was painful. Had a cast on, had to do rehab, had to get back in shape again. But eventually I was walking and riding a bike again. The same thing with the mental health challenge. You have to take care of it, do the rehab, recover, and it will get better. So that's my story and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> Thanks, Lenny. I'm going to ask you a question from the audience, Michael's question, but 
you know, I've interviewed you. I know a little bit about your origin story. I know that you have been an incredibly high achiever in high pressure situations your whole career. As you sort of recovered from your depression, did you reflect on that lifetime of achieving and pushing and the impact it had on your mental health? Did you feel a connection there or no? It's impossible for me to disaggregate the proximate cause of what happened. It's possible, as you say, more that it was accumulation of, you know, 30 years of operating at 100 miles an hour. But I think it's as likely that it was the circumstances of COVID that did it, where both the external circumstances and the job I was doing made me feel like this was so bad and we'd never seen anything like it. And I, you know, I tend to be one of those everything has a solution problem solving types. And I couldn't see a solution to this. It was bad and it was going to get worse. And I think that's as much of what did it. And when I, in that circumstance, thought the way to solve it was to dive deeper into it so you could understand it more and figure out something. And that just meant my mind was working all the time and I wasn't sleeping. So I don't know is the honest answer. It's possible, but the proximate cause is as likely to have been those circumstances. Yeah. And that's the hard thing is sometimes we never know, right? When we go into mental illness, I've got comments from Rita and comments from Tina. Thank you so much for sharing your story to make this just a typical conversation (laughs) to normalize mental health. So Michael asked a question and anyone can jump in and I'm going to hand it over to you, Julie. Anyone who's been through a dark depression can relate to this question. How do you tell yourself it's going to be okay when things don't feel okay? Yeah. Personal experience, I don't know where this is extensible, but to me, when I was in that darkest space, there was no way I ever thought it was going to get better. And it was, this is going to end badly for me and for others. And it was an elevator going down and I couldn't ever see it coming back up. And that's where the people around me were crucial because I couldn't see it and they knew that wasn't me. And so the the answer to how I dealt with it was someone else helped and got me the help I needed because I could not do it by myself. And to think that I could was honestly arrogant and selfish. And that's what they told me. It's like, no, you need help. I don't care. You're going to go. And if you don't go, we're going to make you go. So choose your poison. And to me, that was the intervention that was absolutely necessary because I, there was no way for myself. I could, I could flip where I was at that moment in time. I think it's this idea of belief. In the moment, it feels terrible, and if there's no end in sight, like Nani says, and the power of friendships and those around you, we can't do it alone. But you also have to hold on to say, if you believe it won't get better, you're very lost. But if you say, I may not feel it now, but I believe it will get better. It's not going to. I can say it's not going to get better, and it's going to stay better. You're going to be like this because that's life, but it will go up again. You have to believe that. And it's that belief surrounded by others that can get you over to the next hour, can be hour by hour to the next 24 hours or to the next week. But you have to believe it will get better. Can I add that I think Maura's start for this conversation with gratitude? Gratitude has become my superpower, and I know it's available to all of us as a superpower. The more minute we can be about our gratitude, not I'm grateful for my health, but I'm grateful that you know I was able to floss my teeth this morning because my dentist tells me that's so important and I can see the benefits. The more specific we can be about gratitude, the more it helps us reframe that first of all, there are good things in my life. I am more in charge than, you know, I may feel right now. It sort of grounds us back to that micro unit of, you know, what's going on in our own lives rather than it catastrophizing. And I have found it to be a wonderful way to reset when I'm feeling really low. Julie, I love that. I want to just echo what you said and what Sanjin said about going small. If you think you're not going to be okay, And again, I'm sorry, I'm not giving medical advice here. This is all personal. Minute by minute, bird by bird, right? And making it very focused. I'm so grateful that I can floss my teeth. And and Michael, the last thing I'll share is I, I have bipolar disorder. And so for me, 
when I think things are so dark, it's very scary because it comes back. And my husband will always give me evidence that I've dug out before and I will dig out this time. You know, I went 13 years without a major depression. And when I was in one a couple of years ago, he said, you went 13 years before you did it. Before that, you went six years you're going to do it again. You can do it. And so again, having someone else in your life who can be there and give you evidence is so important. We have so many great questions coming in. I'm going to get to them, but I need to give Julie the mic. Thank you, Laura, for inviting me. Appreciate it. Always love doing anything with our Silicon Guild and also Thinkers 50. Grateful to everybody who's decided to make us a part of their diet of content. Uh, I want to thank Sanyan and Lenny for being so open and vulnerable and really appreciate what came from both of them. Briefly, I am Julie Lithcott Hames, 56 years old. She, they pronouns, I'm black and biracial. And I grew up in white places with a black dad and a white mom. And that means, given my age, that I grew up knowing something was wrong with my family and probably wrong with me. That is, I got the message from the earliest years that we were problematic. And I think it instilled in me this deep sense of we are transgressive, something's wrong with us in the eyes of others, not all others, but enough others to make me worried and afraid. And just as Sanyan said, if you know, if you have imposter syndrome, you want to shout it out in others. I think I became that person who felt so problematic, so unseen, so not valid in my origin story that I have become that person professionally who is seeking to help anyone I interact with know that they matter, they're seen, they're valued. It has become my work. I did that work as a Stanford dean working with undergraduates. And actually, since we have Sanya in here, I have to put in a shout out for Stanford women's basketball because I know she's worked with Coach K. I was consulting with the Stanford women's basketball team this past season on how do you instill this sense of mattering within the team? How do you focus on helping others feel they matter? And this was Coach Vanderveer's year of beating Coach K's record for winningest NCAA basketball coach. So I had to put a shout out for Stanford. Go Stanford. Okay. So Maura has me on her podcast, The Anxious Achiever. And I'm not quite sure why, because, you know, I'm not anxious, but I know I'm competitive. So we start to talk about, you know, my competitive nature. I've been a corporate lawyer. I've been, you know, I'm a now an elected official here in Palo Alto. I'm very sort of type A, win, you know, let's go. And we're sort of starting to unpack where that comes from. And she's talking to me about self-care. And, you know, people talk about self-care. They want to, they, you know, like, what's your method of self-care? And I'm like, don't ask me about bubble baths. I do not take bubble baths. Don't know chocolate. I do not need chocolate. I need games. I do games for fun. I do competitive puzzles for fun fun. Okay. So Maura starts unpacking. Wow. Tell me more. I'm like, well, I got this life partner, Dan of 36 years. And back in the day it was backgammon and Scrabble. And then we New York times crossword and we do it in the paper. And often he would beat me, but I was always trying to like finish first. And you know, he's not that competitive. He doesn't seem to care, but I care, you know, and now of course there's Wordle and Quirtle and Octurtle and global and world, I, you know, my phone every night, you know, I, get on this phone and I'm like, do the puzzles, do the puzzles, do the puzzles. You know, New York Times crossword, it used to just be paper, but now you can do it online and it sends you this chime. It tells you you did it and it's correct. And I just get filled with like, yes. Okay. So even when I get home late at night, like 12, one, I go to my puzzles. It's like, I don't complete the day. That's my time, me time. Do some competitive word-related puzzles, geography puzzles. And I'll stay up super late just to get that done. So Maura's asking me in this realm of, you know, self-care, you know, why do you do these games? You know, why are you so competitive? And I, in conversation with Maura, began to realize for the first time that maybe I'm so into games because in my family, where I was the youngest of many, and the only one who was mixed race, right, I was so different. I was young. The language of love in my family was winning. So we played poker. When you won a hand, I felt loved. You know, 
when you had a verbal repartee with somebody, when you had an argument and one, I felt loved. And certainly every jigsaw puzzle, every crossword puzzle boggle. And if I won, it infused in me this sense of being loved. So I have this epiphany with Mora on a podcast. I'm trying not to cry, right? Like, oh my God, I do these puzzles because I feel loved when I win. <laughs> How scary is that? Like enter this proposition of try a puzzle. You might feel loved, but you might not. Like my God, to win is to feel loved. To not win, therefore, is to feel not loved. I had this aha with Mora. We hang up the podcast. I go running out of my little office here, back into the house. I find Dan and I'm like, Dan, I've learned that I need to win. Like the drive in me to beat you at these New York Times crosswords where you win four out of seven times, maybe five out of seven times a week. My drive is because I feel loved when I win. And my beloved looks at me and he smiles so gently and he cocks his head and he says, so when I win, if I immediately say, I love you, will that be enough? And I scanned myself for my feelings and I said, yes. And that's exactly what happens now. He still beats me four out of seven times. But every single time when the chime goes off and the New York Times, da, 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 Dan beat me, he looks across the table and he says, I love you. And I'm like, thanks. And I keep going because I'm still trying to finish, but I'm feeling it. Thanks. Thanks. And that was profound. So my lessons here are be curious about what you need and why whatever it is, your equivalent of the bubble bath or the chocolate or the crossword. Be curious about where that need comes from deep inside you. It's there for a reason. And then third, know with certainty that everybody has their thing or things, whatever it is. We all have these core building blocks within us that have just constructed the human we are now. And if we can be curious about what someone else desperately needs and how we might be able to offer it without much cost to ourselves in the moment, then we are not only showing up for others and treating them as we want to be treated, but we're being extraordinarily kind. You also have helped a lot of young people and their parents separate from almost a, a shared investment in winning that is so powerful in your role as Dean of undergraduates, Dean of freshmen at Stanford. And I guess my question for you is, do leaders need to love themselves and feel like they matter? Do parents need to love themselves and feel like they matter before they can do the work that you do, which is letting other people know how much they matter? Like, what is that process and what are your thoughts? First of all, let me be clear. I was dean of freshman a long time ago. I left 12 years ago. No, not currently there. Okay. Do leaders and parents have to sort of love themselves first before they can help, before they can really serve employees, serve colleagues, serve kids? I'm going to say no, because how devastating would it be if the answer is yes? Right. Because it's really hard for most of us. I don't know. What I am going to say is like, it sure helps you to show up in a way where you can see and support another human and their growth without being attached to the outcomes they achieve. Like the micromanaging leader is terribly insecure, feels so insecure. They have to constantly look over everyone else's shoulder because they need you to be perfect because how you behave reflects back on them because their own insecurity. So same with parenting, right? I need you to get that A so my friends will feel good about me, right? So when we do the work as a parent, as a leader on ourselves to become that self-loving person who can accept our journey and our growth and all of that, then it's far easier for us to successfully lead and parent. And then I think we can really resonate at that much higher level of leadership and parenting. Maura, you and I have talked about this idea that sometimes when we're trying to help others, we're actually trying to help younger versions of ourselves. And also when we write books or write articles or do podcasts, it's not that we're experts, but we're trying to help solve problems that we're trying to solve for ourselves. We're seeking answers. And it's through those interactions that we can think about those things. So 
when we love others, when we care for others, when we're compassionate towards others, that actually flips around. I think that's an angle towards we can, a way of seeing ourselves and becoming more compassionate for ourselves. So I agree with Julie. We don't have to love ourselves first, but by learning to love ourselves, we can actually be even more effective, right? Julie, your story, I mean, Nani and Julie, both of your stories are so moving. And Maura, I didn't know that about you, about the bipolar. So the courage to share that one is for everyone who's listening, when we feel anxiety or we feel anxious or when life is good, but we feel sad, sometimes we default to thinking we shouldn't feel this way. And it's that shouldn't that makes us feel worse. So just not go there. Two, Julie, in your story about the winning, um, I think a lot of times we have this feeling of not enough. We need that constant validation to prove to ourselves that we are enough, but it's never going to come because it's never enough if we go that angle. And so I wanted to challenge listeners out there with this idea that you are enough. That's something my friend Sue Gordon always says. You have to believe you're enough. You have to believe that your team is enough and they have to believe it too. You know, our children, same thing. They have to believe it too. And then the third is, I think all of us here, we are in the roles that we're in because we want to help others. Because in a way, maybe that's how we save ourselves, right? But we have to also learn, something I learned in therapy is we're not always responsible. And to alleviate that sense of responsibility, because decisions are not always within our control. For our kids, our kids are the decision makers of their own lives. We can help guide, but every person is a decision maker. They own the decisions in their lives. We can help, we can foster the environment and be there. But we also have to accept we're not responsible for everyone else. We can't be for all the good or the, all the bad that happens in their lives. And that's, that's a really hard thing because we all want that element of control, right? So as you were all talking, those were some of the thoughts that come to mind. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life, a promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. From the minds of visionaries to the desks of disruptors, I'm Laura Schmidt, host of the Redefining Work podcast. Join me each week as we explore the new world of work through the lens of those shaping it. CEOs, HR leaders, investors, and more. Be a part of the conversation that changes everything. Subscribe to Redefining Work today. Lenny, I have a question for you. And um, actually, it's two questions. And I'm going to start with Lenny, but either of you can dive in. And Lenny, I remember when I interviewed you, I asked you if your 35-year-old self would have been out there telling his depression story when you were ascending in your career. And you said, I probably, I probably not. I wouldn't have been able to and reach the levels. And I thought that that was probably very true and a, a very honest thing to say that we can all relate to. There's a a question from Indira. How can leaders and managers create a work environment that reduces the pressure to be perfect and supports mental well-being? And then I'm gonna throw in a question from Leeson as well, and you can answer whichever one and we'll go from there. Lenny, thanks for your vulnerability and authenticity. I coach and advise a number of leaders, nearly all men who are struggling. They worry if they reveal their truth, they won't be able to continue to lead. Others will think they're weak. As more of us speak our truth, we normalize the reality that mental challenges are part of being human. But do you have advice? So I think the answer to your first question was the same as you asked me before. I'm not sure I would have been able to. I think that's partly where I was in my own head, but also partly the environment that we are in in today's world versus when we were in almost 30 years ago. I do think it is much more understandable, acceptable, and particularly for younger people to be honest and open about what they're feeling. And 
including in complicated, high-stress work environments. And I think that's actually really, really helpful and relates to my advice on the your second question around how do you help create an environment. It's honestly why when I speak to business groups, what they want, they want to have that open and honest conversation among themselves, but many leaders are not comfortable framing that topic or helping set it up with personal stories. And so I get asked to do it because then I'm the prop that tells my personal story and then everybody else thinks it's okay to do it. And I think that's fine. I'm happy to do that. But what leaders can do is help create that space. Everyone is wrestling with something at that moment in time, some more pronounced and severe than others. And being able to understand that if you don't have your mental game on, you're not going to have your work game on. And so treating it as though, you know, you're Coach K, Sonyan, and someone's hurt, they're not going to be able to play at the top of their game. It's the same thing with mental health. Just treat it as though it were another part of who you are and have that kind of conversation. I am continually amazed about how open people are willing to be to talk about it if they're given the ability to do it. And even even more so in a work setting where there is the pressure to be, no, I'm on my top of my game all the time when that's just not true. And to be able to comment and talk about that actually helps not just the team, but that individual perform better as a result of feeling like they can tell what's really going on. There's a wonderful comment from Eric who says, during the pandemic, I once heard someone say that leaders are dealers of hope in tough times. I think that's really beautiful. Julie Sunyan, do you want to dive in on anything? I can go to our next question. I'm also curious on the role of gender in talking about this stuff and the role of talking about anxieties and fears. Can I just say something on the role of story to, to Lenny's point? And it's so powerful when a guy tells stories. I think we're more as teeing up the notion of gender. I think, you know, we're expected to tell stories and maybe be less analytical, you know, less financial savvy, less, right? We're supposed to be more soft and more story-like as women and, and men are, not, are supposed to be the opposite. And of course, none of it's inherently true about any of us, I think. But I want to say that when I first wrote How to Raise an Adult on the Harm of Micromanagey Helicopter Parenting, I thought I needed to persuade audiences with data from psychologists about how this was harming kids and from the employment realm, you know, they're underprepared for work. And so I thought that sort of research, looking into the research in the area and sort of presenting, making the case. But I quickly learned that, of course, humans learn best from stories. They relate through stories. They remember stories. And so I started telling my own stumbles as a parent, just the ways in which, you know, I have learned the very lessons I'm trying to teach y'all. And so I, with my kids' permission, just became this storyteller in my hour-long keynote. No slides story, 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 and then try to distill the advice out. And people feel so relieved <laughs> that the so-called expert has screwed up and can talk about it. My stories are funny and they're poignant and they're cringy. And I have never connected so powerfully before with folks than when I have been willing to put my vulnerability out there and say like, look, the world, like we're all still here. I just told you that. And we're all, I'm still here. I'm, I'm, you know, it did not crush the soul out of me to share that story with you. Now, maybe you can be more attuned to the story within you and not feel judged, but feel seen and supported. We are all in this together. And one of my favorite phrases in that regard is Ram Das. We're all just walking each other home. And I try to take that approach like, come on, let's walk each other home. I am with you. I am no different than you. And we can learn from each other through our storytelling. I love that so much, Julie. And I wanted to build a little bit more on that. I think what makes this moment especially ripe for mental health challenges is, you know, different than what happened 20, 30 years ago is one, we are increasingly siloed because of technology. Like we, we look around. I was in a coffee shop and 10 years ago in a coffee shop, I would see people talking with each other. Now in that coffee shop, people are on their screens, on their devices. And Martin Enstrom does a lot of work on this. He's another Thinkers 50 awardee. Um, and Martin and I talk a lot about this. We are in this moment where it's very technology. Not that technology is bad, but our addiction to it has created more siloing 
resilience comes from community. Siloing is where, like Lenny said, we can't do it alone, right? And the other thing is polarization. We're in an era of depolarization where we have forgotten how to have conversations. And I love what Julie said in, in the sharing of stories and being vulnerable and being real because that connection, that way of connecting is what makes us human. We were sitting around campfires, sharing stories, watching the stars since the very beginning. And in a world of AI, in a world of technology, we can't compete with AI and smarts, but how we leverage AI is by being more human and this emotion, connection. So I wanted to highlight what Julie said, storytelling as a, as a powerful way of connection. I will add to the cringe, Julie, and one up you, which is that there's a conversation on the chat in the chat about is it okay to cry? Is it okay to cry at work? Is it okay to cry in front of your kids? Let's talk about crying and showing raw emotion. Michael asks, is it okay to let your kids see you cry? There's another question about crying at work. Are we at a place where that's okay? I said to Michael in the chat, just in terms of it, okay to cry in front of our kids, absolutely, yes. Show them that you're human, that we have feelings, that grown ups struggle with stuff. They need to see us struggle and overcome to learn how it's done. Don't take your full sob out on your kids. They don't need to become your therapist. They're not responsible for holding you in those moments. Take that to your therapist, your spouse or partner, to your friends. So in other words, be able to like share it, right? Like, and then smile and say, you know what? This is hard, but we do hard things. We're going to get through this. I have hope. I have confidence. Like that is where you may be acting a little bit, but your kids need to see that you're, you do have hope for the future. You know, think about the parents who are raising kids in times that were excruciating in other decades, you know, think about you know, parents who who managed to instill hope in children during the Holocaust and, you know, who just sort of kept that hope alive. Hope is what keeps us alive. So, you know, we, we want to be the bearers of that truth for our kids. Like, we're going to get through this. Yes. Even as we show them some of our emotion. I think it's also important to contextualize. In our minds, we can expect others to be mind readers. We know why we're crying. We know it's going to be okay, but they don't know that. And so to be able to contextualize it, and there isn't a habit of people being able to show emotions. So people at work, especially, so people don't know how to take that when I cry. So um, I remember I was doing an interview with Keith Reinhardt, and he's telling this beautiful story about he and his wife. And I started crying. I was like, I'm crying because I'm crying because this is so beautiful because I'm happy, right? Just to contextualize it. So contextualizing it, and like what Julie said, to say, okay, I'm crying because I'm frustrated, but I have hope in the future, right? That that helps people know where to place that emotion and that it's okay for them to share that emotion. Emotions don't have to be scary, right? They can be real and they don't have to be scary. And that's a gift we can give other people. You're right, by showing that we can be both. You know, can I jump in and say, I didn't even know I had anxiety until my kids had anxiety and I mean, they were diagnosed and then I was able to kind of see some of my own patterns and behaviors a little bit more clearly. And I realized my mother who also lives with us has, you know, stiff upper lip British person, no place for feelings and a whole lot of patterns around controlling her anxiety. In other words, I was able to learn from my kids experience like, Oh, wait a minute. I'm that way. To, wait a minute. I've got this like tight, this inside me or like get really stressed out in the kitchen. Like I need everything to be. And I'm offering this because I think there's so much more available for kids now than was the case when we were growing up. You know, you might be diagnosed with something. You might be able to get some treatment. You might be able to get some meds. And for many of us who are, you know, Gen X and boomers, we're still coming to terms with stuff. Nobody really knew about us. And we may have figured out a hack to get ourselves through life fairly successfully, but you know, I am, I am relieved to discover there's a name for what I would just call like, sometimes I just really get like impossible to be around really snippy, really, you know, really tight. So learning about my own journey by watching, you know, my kids go through theirs is sort of the reverse of what you think it's going to be. But nevertheless, I want to offer each of you a quick opportunity to reflect. I'll leave this question from Indira. 
what are the long-term effects of not addressing anxiety and the pressure to be perfect in one's professional life? How does striving for perfectionism or any of the winning we've talked about affect personal and professional relationships over time? I mean, I think, Julie, you your experience of having a name for it by learning through your kids must have felt so freeing. So I invite you to reflect on that or to share one way that you are your own best friend, a tool you use. I'll just say, since I've become much more open and willing to talk about my own circumstances, my professional relationships, in addition to personal ones, have become much, much stronger. It did not at all detract from my ability to lead. In fact, if anything, it made it where people could feel that they could come talk to me about something that they may have felt threatened about raising before. And in addition, we have very different kinds of conversations. And as a leader, you can help coach others in different ways if you understand the broader circumstance within which they're operating. So I would just say, while in an earlier time in my career, I might have felt it was going to be career limiting or unprofessional, or as you might say, Julie, unmanlike to do that, I think exactly the opposite now. I think about this conversation we just had. I mean, I've known Maura, Lenny, and Julie for years, and I felt we got to a deeper level in this type of conversation because we're vulnerable with each other. And imagine for the listeners out there, this can be the type of conversation that you can have with your family, with your friends, um, people you trust, and what would happen when you start having these type of conversations? You may discover that this feeling, the sense that you think it's only endemic to you, that others feel it too. And we can figure out ways, share ways, get advice from each other for ways. Because we all need, like Maura, what you're, you said about your husband, those touchstone memories, that reminder, like, you've been here before. Yeah. You know what? Different contexts, but you'll be able to get there. We all need that from each other. So as I reflect on being in this conversation and how I'm feeling so much more helpful and so much more in love with all of you, that imagine if we can do this more often with those others and those in our friend circles. We're all, we all have agency to do that. I know that striving for perfectionism means I only feel as good as the last thing that I did. So a perfectionist is always in search of some external proof that they are worthy. And so it haunts you, it eats you up inside. And I think the long-term effect, I'm not a psychologist, but you know that sort of continue hollowing out of the self it erodes you literally, and it makes you really hard to be around. And what I want to offer is apology, or at least just acknowledgy, acknowledgy instead of apology. I said to my kids one day, like, I'm so sorry I get so stressed out in the kitchen. I don't know why I am this way. I'm curious. I'm working on it. I know I get anxious. It's not about you. And my kids' eyes just filled with this love, like, okay, mom, thanks. And I was like, so I'm working on it. Just know that I'm working on it. And I got all of this grace back in response. I think we can also get that in the workplace, depending on the workplace. But I want to offer that being that transparent about the fact that you know you got a thing and you're kind of trying to work on it can really earn you a lot of grace from the people in your lives, whether work or family. Y'all are the best. And I just want to thank you tremendously. That's it for today. Our show is produced and edited by Mary Dew. Our assistant producer and sound engineer is Nick Krinko. Many thanks to the LinkedIn Presents family and to all our guests for sharing their stories. If you love the show, tell your friends. I would love you to leave a review because they really matter in helping the show get found. You could also follow us or subscribe. If you have a question for me or you want to submit an idea for the show, find me on LinkedIn where you can follow me, message me, I promise I'll write back, or subscribe to my newsletter for more from the Anxious Achiever world. Thanks for listening.